for the record uh, and out of our uh, palms appreciation i would like to thank yamaha for uh, being the sponsors of the conference the palm conference and uh, uh, at the Palm Conference we hold in uh, very high regard at the exhibition. Uh, we treat the platform very seriously for all the audio engineers in the country. And uh, in this respect, we appreciate very much Yamaha's uh, support for the conference. Please give them a big hand. And uh, I would like to give a certificate also for participation to Andy and uh, Smita. Let's do that. So uh, what I want to say is that this session goes far beyond the uh, uh, present moment. Uh, we are recording the session. The session will be on the Palm website right through the year. And uh, all the engineers who would like to have been here, they will have an opportunity to go over the session again and benefit from it. Thank you very much. Please welcome Andy. So, yes, let's talk about how to be successful with audio networking in live events. So the topics we're going to cover this afternoon include the questions, why use a network? We're going to look at the tools, cables, and labels that you need. And we're going to ask, why use Dante? Then we'll move on to helping you to understand about IP addresses. We'll ask, when do you need to use a network switch? And I'll give you some tips on how to be a network master and how to create redundancy or reliability in your network. Then we'll finish by asking a question, what are VLANs? and trunks. So hopefully everyone here will learn something, even if you have been using Dante networking uh, sometime before, I'm sure you will still learn something new this afternoon. So let's start with the first question. Why do networking in live events? Well, the first point, it will give you a better sound. Because analog cabling is prone to interference and noise. It's going to give you lower latency. Because without networking, you'll be having a lot of uh, format conversions between analog and digital, between all your equipment. Um, so if you keep everything digital between microphone and loudspeaker, then you are going to have a shorter delay in your system. Then the next step, you'll have a quicker setup because your cabling will be reduced. You won't have so many cables and they'll be lighter and smaller. Then it's going to be more reliable as well because if you think 90% of all your problems are related to cables, yes? If you have less cables, you're going to have less problems. But this is only going to be true if you learn the new skills necessary for networking. By the way, this guy I know He's working on a golf club. <laughs> Yamaha makes golf clubs as well, you see. <laughs> You've got to learn new skills. So let me give you some tips about the tools, cables, and labels. What tools do we need if we're going to start networking? Well, we're going to be using Cat5 and Cat6 cables a lot. So we should always carry some spare cable with us. 
You can buy them low cost in uh, big drums like that, maybe 500 meter rolls. Um, it's easy to carry spare kit around and the spare connectors. These are called RJ45 connectors. And you need a tool to help you put the cable into the connector. These are all small and low cost things that you can carry with you. But you should learn the way the eight pins of the cable go in. Because it, it's not intuitively in order. You take a look. There's four colored pairs. You have the orange pair, then you have one green, then the blue pair, then another green, then the brown pair. So try to learn and memorize that connection, and that will help you make your cables faster. So you can easily repair and make your own cables much easier and quicker than an uh, analog mic cable. Next, I recommend you have some kind of cable tester. Or if you want to go to the next level, not just a cable tester, but a cable analyzer. So a cable tester will check if you get signal from the first end to the next end. The cable analyzer will tell you how much data the cable can carry if it's suitable for 100 megabits per second or 1,000 megabits per second, for example. Even a cable analyzer, like this one pictured, it can tell you where there is damage in the cable. For example, it could tell you after 10 meters, there is some damage. So then you know you can cut the cable at the 10 meters, make a new termination. You have a shorter cable, but it's going to be good and reliable. So they are quite uh, special, useful tools to have. So every network engineer will be carrying these tools with him. Uh, next, network cables. What's the difference between Cat5, Cat6, and Cat7? Do you know the difference? They all use four twisted pairs of cable, but the difference is the number of twists per meter, how many times the cables are twisted in a one meter length. Cat6 has more twists than Cat5. Also, there's a difference in the quality of the shielding. And if you look at the picture, you can see Cat6 cable has this uh, separator in between the four pairs. And Cat7 has a shield around every pair. So it's uh, stronger against interference. Anyway, for audio networking, Cat5 is not good enough. Please do not use Cat5. Cat5e, yes, you can use. There is a difference. Cat5e, small e or big e, is suitable for audio networking. Cat6 also, yes, is good and suitable. Cat7 is also good and suitable, but not necessary in most cases. Cat7 is just more difficult <laughs> to handle, a little bit more expensive, not so flexible. So my recommendation is stick with Cat6 or Cat5e. Another important point about cables is the type. UTP, FTP, STP, what does that mean? It's a type of shield. So UTP is unshielded twisted pair. FTP is foiled twisted pair. STP is, sh is a sheath twisted pair. Two different types of shielding. Shielding is good to reduce electrical interference or electromagnetic interference. UTP we should not use. It's unshielded and therefore can pick up too much interference. 
FTP or STP is good for us to use. One other key point is the type of copper in a cable. So if you want to run a long cable, say more than 60 meters, then we must consider to use copper that is solid core. See the difference here. One thick bit of copper in each core rather than many small stranded bits. I'll show you the difference. I've got two types of cable here. You can come up later and have a feel. This one is stranded. It's good to use as kind of stage cable because it's very flexible and it will easily lie flat on the floor. So it's quite, quite stable and safe on stage. But this type of cable that's really flexible um, should only be used up to, say, 50 meters. Uh, longer will not be safe. This, however, this is solid copper cable like this. It's more stiff. Uh, and it's less flexible. It doesn't always lie well straight on the floor, so it's, it's not, not so safe on a stage, but it will go long distance. It will carry your data 100 meters. So two different types for different purposes. Some more advice for you. Maybe some of you uh, have been using or are considering to use these kind of couplers. So if your cable is too short, then maybe you want to have a coupler to join two cables together. If you use these, make sure they are one gigabit per second uh, compatible. Otherwise, they will lose data for you. But still, be very careful, because a lot of these do not carry the data well and they could make your network stop working. Your network will become a not work. <laughs> so if your cable is too short, get a longer one. Make a longer one. These are risky items when we are talking about audio networking. Now, if you ever need to carry your audio data more than 100 meters, never make a copper cable more than 100 meters, okay? Never more than 100 meters, please. If you want to go more than 100 meters, you must start using fiber optic cables. You can get various types. You can get low cost uh, plastic ended types. You can get higher cost rugged types like this Neutrik cable. Fiber is great at carrying data long distance. You avoid all interference and you avoid any grounding problems. If you use fiber, you will have no hum in your audio from grounding. No problem at all. So that's really useful. Sometimes your copper audio cables can pick up interference from LED walls or wireless transmitters, but your fiber cables will never pick up interference. So they are really good to use in tricky uh, industrial environments or in uh, TV shows where there's massive amounts of lights and LED walls. So fiber is your friend. There are many different types of fiber. We need to look for the OM3 standard for one gigabit audio networking. Okay, OM3 is the standard to look for. One thing with fiber is that it can get dirty and when it's dirty, it will stop transmitting your data correctly. So always 
carry with you fiber optic cleaner kit if you are using fiber. It's not expensive at all, but it will help you to solve your fiber problems. Next. Probably you'll never see something like that in an audio network, but the point is always label your cables so that if you have a lot of them, you know which one is connected to which equipment. So in a network, you can have many cables coming to one device uh, network switch. So it's good to label the cables so you know which one is connected. It takes a little time to label everything, yes, but it will make it quicker to find any problems. Another issue with cable ties. Of course, you want to keep a cable tidy and neat. A tidy cable will be a long-lasting cable. But when you want to coil them up and make them tidy, never make it too tight. You don't want to squash the cable. Okay, So you can use Velcro or tape, but don't pull it tight because you can squash it and make the copper pairs come closer together, that will cause more interference between the pairs and it will make your cable less reliable. So use these kind of Velcro ties that don't go too tight. You'll be safe. So that's enough about the cabling and so on. Now let's talk a little bit about Dante. We know there are many different networking formats uh, in the world today. I have used all of these different types at various times. So why am I recommending to use Dante for live sound? Let me tell you the advantages that Dante has over all the other network types for audio. Firstly, Dante is scalable from one channel to thousands. You can get a microphone like this one, which has Dante out, so a one-channel device. And you can have an audio mixing console, which can handle uh, hundreds of channels coming in and out. Then another key point is Dante controller software. Uh, no one else makes software quite like it. It's just one piece of software that will help you to manage and monitor all Dante devices, every one. There's more than a thousand Dante devices available, and they can all be controlled from one software. No other network gives you that much control and um, management capability. Also, there's the redundancy. So most Dante devices have two network ports for redundancy. If one gets cut, the other one continues without any break. So no other network handles redundancy in as, uh, as easy and reliable a way as Dante does. Then we've got low latency. So from one Dante device to another, many devices can support a latency of 0.15 milliseconds. Well, most Dante devices can handle 0.25 milliseconds at least. So you know it's, it's lower latency than, than the human ear can really uh, notice. And another great thing, you don't need network switches with small Dante systems. Even if we were using a Dante system here, we wouldn't need a switch. We have a mixing console, we could have a wireless mic receiver and amplifiers. So that's one, two, three devices in a chain. You don't need a switch if you use Dante. If you use other network types, you will need network switches. So we can reduce the amount of devices you need in your network. And if we do use switches, we can use standard Ethernet switches. Nothing special is required. 
Uh, I'll come back to a little bit more information about switches later, but now let's take a little detour and let's talk about IP addresses. So probably networking is new to a lot of audio engineers and it's important to understand about IP addresses. So it helps us to understand how Dante is working. So let me tell you a little bit about this. IP means internet protocol. You know what an address is, don't you? An address, if it's on a letter, helps you to find a person. You can have an email address to help you send a message. If you know the address of where you want to go, you can program some navigation to help you get there. Addresses are essential for communication. In a network, we also use addresses. IP addresses are used by Dante equipment and you find them in your home and office networks. These IP addresses consist of four numbers. Let's say A, B, C, D. Four sets of numbers. Each number is between 0 and 255. So there are 256 possibilities for each part of the address. By the way, 256, that is equivalent to 8 ones in a binary format, just so you know. Let's compare to mailing addresses. So A, let's consider this to be your county or region. B could be your town, C your street, D your building or house number. So here we have an address. This is the largest, most significant part. This is the smallest part. Now, as well as having an address, we have something called a subnet. A subnet determines how big the network is. It's like having a, a border around a town. Or maybe you know, in history, ancient towns always had a wall around them for protection. And that wall would limit the size of the town. That's like your subnet, your wall of protection to limit the size of your network. And like IP addresses, your subnet has four groups of numbers from 0 to 255. So here is a typical number for a subnet, 255.255.255.0. That's a typical one you'll find in most homes and offices. What does it mean? This, when you see this number, it means your network is limited to 256 addresses or devices. It means all IP addresses with the same ABC address can communicate with each other. Any address with a different number here will be hidden from the network. So it's like the subnet mask is hiding all other addresses with different first numbers. In a town situation, it's like saying to your child, you can play with any children on your street, but you cannot leave the street. So it's restricting all your devices can only communicate with each other where their last number is different. That's like the, the building, building number. 
Now, in Dante, we use a larger subnet. Sometimes you can imagine 256 devices is not enough in a big network with lots of amplifiers and microphones. So Dante uses a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. What does this mean? This means we are allowed 256 buildings on 256 streets. So we have 256 streets, each with 256 buildings. That means we have 65,000 houses or buildings or devices in our Dante network. So Dante can handle 65,000 devices. So you will see in a Dante network, because of this subnet, it means all Dante devices will have the same A and B part of their IP address. <clears throat> the C and the D part can all be different. So this is like saying to your child, you can play with any other child in the town, but you cannot leave the town. So it's given you a bigger opportunity, but still a nice uh, restriction. So now we've learned what IP addresses mean, how do we actually use them? Well, it's mostly automatic. So most home and office network use an automatic IP address assignment so you don't have to type those numbers at all. And that facility is called DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So whenever your smartphone joins a Wi-Fi network, the Wi-Fi router will give your phone an IP address using DHCP. Dante uses the same system to give IP addresses to a Dante device. So in most of our home and office networks, the Wi-Fi router will give you an IP address. And normally, your IP address, if you look in your smartphone, you'll find it has a fixed, uh, fixed ABC number, and then the last number will be different for every device in your Wi-Fi network. You'll often see these numbers, 192.168.0 or 1. They are frequently used by Wi-Fi. So it is possible for a DHCP server or Wi-Fi router to give a different IP address to the same device every time you connect. It is possible. And that's fine, because normally we don't care about IP addresses. It's all automatic, and it just works for our smartphones and our Wi-Fi. And it's the same for Dante. It does just work. But some devices, in some situations, cannot receive DHCP. They have to be programmed manually. Some uh, some Yamaha mixers actually have to be programmed manually. If you do mixing on Yamaha consoles, maybe you recognize this image here from a CL5 or QL5 console. There you have to set an IP address manually. So there you have to check what range is your DHCP server using, and you have to use the same range here. Uh, so in this case, you also see something called a gateway address. What is that? Well, a gateway is your access from your home or office network to the internet, to the wider world. 
So a gateway is like the doorway from your town to the outside world. So in most cases, the gateway address is going to be the IP address of your Wi-Fi router. And again, that's normally given automatically to your smartphone. And it's typically looking like this, ending with a number one. Sometimes on your smartphone, you'll also see something called a DNS server. This is a domain name service that translates IP addresses into website addresses, www.something. Every web address is connected to an IP address, but it's difficult to remember IP addresses. So this domain name service does the translation for us between www.something and the IP address. So we don't, we don't need that for Dante, but when you see it, normally it's going to be the same number as the Wi-Fi router or gateway, because one device will be your gateway and your uh, name server at the same time. Anyway, Dante doesn't need that. So let's get to Dante and IP addresses. So if you are using a DHCP server or Wi-Fi router in your Dante network, then your Dante devices will receive the IP addresses automatically from that server. And when you open Dante controller, you will see the IP addresses listed here in your device info page. If you don't have a DHCP server or Wi-Fi router in your network, then no problem. Dante will give itself an IP address using this address, 169254. That is the default IP address subnet that your Dante devices will use. So they will automatically use this. And so will your computers. If you connect your computer to a network that doesn't have a DHCP server, then your computer will get this kind of IP address as well. Maybe you've seen it before. So it's very clever. It is called zero conf or zero configuration. You don't have to set up anything for it to work, and that is fantastic. You can connect your computer to a Dante network without doing any IP address programming, and you know it's going to work. Maybe some of you know Dante has a secondary network available for redundancy if you want to use it. That will also set its IP addresses automatically but with a different set of numbers, so you don't get confused between secondary and primary networks. Now, if you want to use a DHCP server, or if you're going to use one, um, one I typically use is this Apple Airport Express because it's very easy to set up. Now, you can set it up to limit its range of IP addresses. Its default is going to be this address, 1001.something. So you can tell it to give devices IP addresses starting with 2 and then ending with 122. So here we can have 120 addresses applied automatically. That means we still have a bunch of addresses available for us to use programming manually, like we need to with the CL and QL mixing consoles. So you can mix automatic devices with manual devices by restricting the range of your DHCP service. So uh, that's getting a little bit more advanced. So let's continue and ask this question. When do you need a switch? 
Well, I should ask a few more questions before I give you an exact answer. I should ask you, how many devices do you need in your network? You see, we know that Dante can handle a daisy chain of devices without a switch, but there is a limit to its length. We shouldn't really have more than 10 devices in a chain without using a switch. So let's say you need a switch when you have more than 10 devices. Then how many locations are there for the devices? So if you have many different locations, let's say I've got five Dante devices up here, and I've got five Dante devices at the back of the hall. Now, to save a lot of cabling, I could have one switch here and one switch there. Then I have five short cables here, then one long cable, and then five short, short cables over there. So switches can help to reduce the length of your cables and the number of long cables. Then I could ask, is it a mobile system? That will determine how strong you need your switch to be. And I could ask, do you need redundancy in your system? If you want redundancy, that is spare cables, then you will need to use uh, some switches. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And if you need to use fiber optic cables, you're going to need a switch to convert from copper cables to fiber cables. One more point to consider. Do you want to mix Dante data with other network data? So these days, um, a lot of devices will be using Dante for audio, and they'll also have a communication network, maybe amplifiers, for example, that can be monitored from uh, computer software. Or a lot of wireless mic receivers can be monitored by computer software. So you have a control network as well. So if you want to mix all the control data with Dante, then you need a switch to handle that connectivity. Uh, now let's go back to this one. How many network devices? So let's say we've got a system like this. Two stage boxes, a mixing console, and a computer for live recording. Four devices using Dante. We only need three cables. We don't need a switch. This is a simple setup. Actually, the, the default setup. And we call this a daisy chain. You know why we call it a daisy chain? So um, in England, the daisy, it's a small flower that grows in the grass. And children like to pick them. And then you can make a hole in the stem of one of them and feed the flower through. It's like making a chain of flowers, you know, like you wear around your neck, a chain of daisies. And somehow we've applied it to <laughs> digital technology. So it's like a chain of flowers. <laughs> so this is the easiest Dante system to set up. You can bring the devices out of the box and plug, plug them in like this. But it does limit your network size. You should not have more than 10 devices in a chain like this. And you have no redundancy. Of course, if you break this cable, then you lose connection from these two devices to the other two devices. You break this cable, you end up with two separate networks. So if you're going to grow in size, then you can use a switch. Uh, though, you know, you can combine daisy chain with using a switch. Uh, so this is quite, quite nice. So here we can see two daisy chains. So here, let's say you've got three amplifiers in one rack. You can have short linking cables between those devices and then one long one to the switch here. 
or down here, you've got one long cable and then a short one to the recorder. So two daisy chains within a switch. We can do this. This could be more convenient for your cabling. And of course, some cables are critical. If this one gets broken, then you've lost connection. But here it's less critical. If one cable gets lost, only one device gets lost from, from the network. So it gives you a little bit more safety. So we can use a switch to simplify our cable connections. If we have three positions for our network, then we could use one switch in each position, like this amp rack, monitor console and stage boxes, and then front of house system here. You can see what I've done. So here we need only two long cables. So using switches will reduce the long cables you need. And we can support much larger systems. So here, it's quite easy to imagine one computer at front of house can monitor and control all of the amplifiers on stage. But still, we have no redundancy there. If you want to have redundancy, so if any cable breaks, we don't lose any audio, then we have to increase the number of switches. So here's an example of a redundant network. There's two switches in each location here. So you see two switches on stage, two switches at front of house. So in a larger setup like this, we have to set every device to redundant mode in the Dante setup, redundant mode. And then we have redundancy for all cables and switches. So if any cable gets cut, audio continues. So all your Dante devices are transmitting on both networks at the same time. So if any cable in your primary network is cut, the audio will still reach the destination using the secondary network. Even if a primary switch gets cut off, if the power cable gets pulled out, no problem, then the secondary network will carry all of the audio with no silence. It'll be instant switching. So this is a, a very clever way to give you safety and redundancy. I wish I could demonstrate it to you here, but that's a lot of equipment to bring in <laughs> to the room. So yeah, the only downside is you need extra switches and extra cables, so it takes longer to set up. So you would use that in critical, important situations. If you are providing sound for the prime minister, you would probably want to have this protection. So now we can see the kind of networks where we need switches. What type of switch should we look for? Well, when we're talking about live sound, there's a few key things to consider. Firstly, it should have a stable and strong mains power connection. So here, uh, an IEC cable with a locking connector is available on this switch. Some other switches just have a very small little uh, DC connector which could easily fall out or the cable is, is so small and fragile. They could be a risk when you have a mobile live sound system. Then uh, what type of connector are you going to have for your network cable? So these are metal chassis. These are called EtherCon 
uh, from Neutrik Ethercon. They are strong. You can stand on them, and they're still going to work. They give you strong protection for your network. So this kind of connector is going to be suitable for live sound, uh, more so than these kind of network connectors that can easily break. They are plastic. Then another point to consider, can your switch be rack mounted into your rack with your stage boxes or with your amplifiers? So if you've got rack connectors, it's going to be more stable. But one lesson I learned very quickly is, <laughs> will the screws fall out in the first tour? So a number of switches I've used, like this one, they're kind of domestic or, or office switches made for office networks, they are not made for touring. If you carry one around with you, <laughs> especially on the, the roads around India, the little screws are going to fall out <laughs> and it's going to literally fall apart. So you need something that's strong and rugged built for uh, mobile entertainment. Lucky Yamaha makes a switch <laughs> just like that. You can see here this the SWP-1 switch is built ideally for touring mobile entertainment. And this switch comes with additional features as well, which are going to be really handy. So we've got monitoring software. Let me show you what this can do. It can monitor every device in the network, and it can tell you if it's a Dante-enabled device. And it's going to check your network capacity. Every network port is going to tell you how much bandwidth is being used in a percentage, maybe from 5% up to 95%. And it's going to tell you when there's errors, like if a device is missing, so broken cable, or you forgot to connect a cable, it's going to highlight the device with a red color saying it's missing. And if somebody adds a new device to the network, it's going to tell you it's found a new device. So you, you know when one of your colleagues is trying to connect something you don't want in the system. <laughs> and it can detect a cable loop as well. You know, you can easily break an office network just by connecting the two ends of one cable to the same switch. Have you ever tried that? One cable from like port one to port two, a short connecting cable, that can ruin your office network. <laughs> but this Yamaha switch will protect you from such mistakes. Let me show you what happens. Let's say you've built this network, two stage boxes, a mixing console, and a computer using these four ports here. Now, it'll be working just fine, but if you create a loop, then you can expect so s the network to go silent. Um, I should have some graphics to show you what happens. So, uh, it's going to detect and block the loop. So, if you connect this by mistake, so you've got a loop here. Then, at first, the data is going to start going round and round and build up. It's going to be like a feedback loop between a microphone and a loudspeaker. Get louder, louder, louder. It's going to be like that here. And the switch is going to detect it, and it's going to stop one of its network ports from communicating. So then you have a daisy chain here instead of a loop. It's going to find it and block it and carry on working. So many switches will not do that for you, but this one will. So it protects you from problems. Let me now give you some tips on how to manage your network. How's our time? We've got plenty of time. Good. So, I mentioned Dante Controller software before. Please get to know it. Dante Controller is going to be your friend 
in your network and it's going to help you to keep a reliable network running. And the best thing is it's free of charge. It's free to download from the Ordinate website. Ordinate is the company that develops Dante. So Dante Controller is not just for setting up the network and for, for routing, but it's also for monitoring and troubleshooting your network. You can use the software's facilities to help you check how well your network is working. And it can help you to find any faults. <clears throat> so let me give you some tips for checking your network. Check number one is happening in the device info page of the software. <clears throat> in this page, we can check if all the devices are detected. Obviously, if a device is not detected, you've got to ask why. Maybe it's got a broken cable. Maybe its firmware is not up to date. Maybe its IP address is in the wrong setting. So here it will list the IP addresses. So you can check they all have the same first numbers and a different last number. <coughs> and another thing you should always check in your network is the link speed over here. We should see one gigabit per second Actually, there's some small Dante devices that work at 100 megabit per second, uh, like the microphones with one port. But most Dante devices work at one gigabit per second, so we should see one gigabit per second. If you see something lower than that, sometimes I've seen 10 megabits per second, which is too slow for Dante to work correctly. If you see something like that, check your cable, because uh, a damaged cable can force the network to run at a lower speed. So if you see 10 megabits per second there, your cable is likely to be the cause, and you can change it and see that go back to one gigabit per second. Yeah, hopefully not a broken switch, but you could have damage in the connector of the switch, uh, possibly, to cause the same problem. Check two is going to be in the clock status page of Dante Controller. Here you should check who is the master clock. There's always only one master in your Dante network. <clears throat> if you see more than one master, then you, you know there's something broken in the network. So in most cases, your Dante network is going to run at 48 kilohertz, though some newer devices will work at 96 kilohertz. Uh, anyway, always check. Who is the master clock? Is it the expected device? So you can manually force a device to be a master, you've got this setting, preferred master setting, you can see over here. By default, this is on for all Yamaha consoles. So a CL or a QL mixing desk will have that on by default. So you can maybe just see here, Yamaha CL5 console is the master. This top device is my computer, and the computer cannot be a master. That's always a slave. <coughs> so select your preferred master. You could choose the device that you always switch on first and switch off last. It would make sense for that one to be your master device. Anyway, check. You have green lights next to every device. If you see red or orange, then it's uh, not synchronized fully. A green light must be there. So Dante clock, let's just explain a little bit about this. 
if you imagine a transport network, this is the London Underground, very familiar to me. My old office is here, my home was down here. Uh, so, in a transport network, all the clocks of the trains have to be synchronized so they know the times. Otherwise, if a train is coming here at the same time a train is coming here, they're going to crash. You don't want to crash. So you keep in time. In a digital audio network, it's the same. Every device has to have the same time to be synchronized so you don't lose any data. So in a Dante network, one device transmits the time clock to all the other devices. Actually, every device has its own clock. So the master device makes sure all the other devices are keeping the same time. So if the master device loses connection, each other device still has a clock to work. And another device will become the master. So automatically, you have a backup for the clocks in Dante. And you don't lose audio from those other devices. So in a Dante network, where we know there can only be one master, there is a hierarchy or a selection process. So if you have selected one device to be the preferred master that you can see here, then you know that device is going to be the master device. But if you have two preferred masters, then which one is going to become the master? Well, it depends. If you have anything set to sync to external clock, that's over here, this far side. Normally, you're going to have nothing selected here, normally. But maybe in a TV studio, you have a house clock system. And you need the house clock system to synchronize your Dante devices. Then maybe you need something ticked here to bring the house clock into your Dante network. So if you have that selected, then then the device that has preferred master and sync to external selected will become your master device. What happens if you've got two preferred masters and two sync to external devices? Then which one is going to be the master? There is another step to the selection process. The Dante device with the best quality clock will become the master. What if both those devices have the same quality clock in their hardware? And most Dante devices do have the same <laughs> level uh, quality of clock. Then how do we decide? Well, it's the first device to be powered on that wins to become the master. But what if they were both switched on at the same time? I hear you think. <laughs> then there's one more process. The Dante device with the lowest MAC address. MAC is a, a unique address for every network device given by the manufacturer. So MAC, manufacturer address. So ev every one will be a unique number and the device with the lowest number will become the master. So you've got these five levels of hierarchy for who's going to be the master. And all the Dante devices will automatically talk to each other to determine which one is going to be the master. So they're always checking and communicating by themselves. Aren't they clever? <laughs> Th 
The next check we should do is in the next page. We now have network status. What can we learn from this page? We should look at the transmit and receive bandwidths. So transmit, you can see here. How much Dante data am I sending out of the device? So if you look at a stage box, you're going to have a large number on the transmissions and a smaller number on the receivers because you're sending out a lot of data from the stage box to the mixing desk. And if you see here, my computer used for recording has a large number for receiving but a small number for transmitting because I'm only recording, I'm not playing back. So here you can check how much bandwidth is used in your network. Typically, you're using 10 megabits per second for every four channels of audio. So 40 channels of audio will use about 100 megabits per second. Therefore, you can work out if you've got a one gigabit per second connection, you can carry about 400 audio channels. You can also check your latency setting over here. Latency is how long it takes the audio to go from one device to the other device in your network. And you can manually set this for most Dante devices. So check it is set as required. Uh, 250 microseconds uh, is one of the fastest options you can select. And you can use that in networks with uh, up to three switches between each device. But you could use a latency setting up to five milliseconds, then you can use massive, massive networks with thousands of devices. Anyway, the key point is, do you have a green light for your latency status and your packet errors? Green is good. You could have an orange light to indicate risky, or you could have a red light to indicate not working. So you have another page in Dante Controller where for each device, you select your device here, and then you see the latency there. And then you can, in real time, check the status of your data through the network, how long it is taking to reach the destination. And this is really cool. You cannot see this in any other audio networking software. It's really clever. So you can see the average latency, and you can see the peak latency. So in this case, I'm really safe. This is my stage box transmitting to my front of house console. The setting is 250 microseconds. But in reality, the data is taking on average 101 microseconds. And the maximum time was taken was 125 microseconds. So I've got a big buffer. The Dante device will buffer the latency up to 250. So we have a constant latency for the audio. So I have headroom of more than 100 microseconds of headroom in the latency buffer. So this is really safe. So green is good. Orange is risky. Orange means you're close to the limit of the latency buffer. If you go red, then you've exceeded the buffer, and that audio data has to be dropped or discarded, then you will get a little bit of silence. So that's a rough idea of how it works. Yeah, red equals late. Late means lost, forgotten, a little bit of silence. What could cause that? Maybe a restriction in your network, so possibly too much traffic, but we know a gigabit network can carry 400 channels, and it's difficult to make 400 channels, 
So that's not often going to happen. So maybe you have a mistake with your word clock. Maybe a device is set to sync to external by mistake. So you could check that. If a device is trying to get clock from outside of Dante, while every other device is getting clock from inside Dante, there could be a conflict. So al always check your latency. There's one more thing to check as well. This is the clock status monitor. So you can see down the bottom right corner a little green box for clock status monitor. Well, it's green if it's good and stable. It could be orange for risky, or it could be red for not working. So if you click your mouse on that clock status monitor, you get this window. And this window can help you in real time check the stability of your clock. If it's green, it's stable and good. If it's orange, it's risky, in danger of causing some silence. If it's red, then it's not in sync, and you're going to get some click sounds and some audio dropouts. So you need to fix it quickly. So for each device, you can check every device's clock. So here's one which is at risk. It's got a lot of variation in its uh, clock. So you know it's a little bit unstable. What can you do to check that? Firstly, check your cables and connectors are all in good condition. If a cable is damaged and it's working only at 100 megabit per second or 10 megabits per second, that can cause enough trouble here. Uh, again, if you've got sync to external clock set by mistake, that's the setting over here in the clock window. If you've got this enabled without preferred master, then you'll have a conflict between different clocks and they will not be able to synchronize. Okay, or rare cases switch maybe not set right or network might be too busy but that's going to be a very rare situation in only the largest dante networks where you've got more than 400 channels okay uh, we're getting close to the end hopefully there'll be time for a few questions at the end um, if we run out of time <laughs> then I'll be in the Yamaha hall for the rest of the show and you can talk to me then. Anyway, let's just quickly talk a bit about redundancy and uh, switches and networks. So, when you are building a network like this, where you have redundancy, you have an orange primary network and you have a yellow secondary network, my advice to you is do not make a secondary network until you know your primary network is working. Okay? Make just one network first, verify it's working correctly, then connect your secondary network. That will help you to do it more quickly and it will help you to find uh, any mistakes quickly because there are many mistakes you can make like get the cables switched the wrong way round, or keep one device in a daisy chain mode by mistake, so it's linking the primary network with a secondary in a kind of loop. So make your primary before you make your secondary. Then you can find your mistakes much easier. And Dante Controller software will help you to find your mistakes. If you connect the secondary port by mistake to your primary network, the Dante controller software will make the device name go a red color, so you know it's connected wrong. Then go back to your uh, clock status page and check your network master. 
If your network is made correctly, you're going to have the same master for primary and secondary networks. Okay, the same device must be the master. If there are different masters, then you know there's a problem somewhere in your system. So then you can check your cables and your connections. Now, last topic. What are VLANs and trunks? And how can they be useful to audio networks? First, VLAN. V means virtual. A virtual local area network. This is where different users of the network can share the network without them uh, getting in each other's way, let's say. It's a way to save cost, so you don't need so many switches, um, but you don't have to mix all the data together. So you can separate a switch into segments, each segment a different virtual network. VLANs. Do you like pizza? Are you familiar with the Italian Four Seasons pizza? Or Quattro Stagioni? Four Seasons in Italian. If you know this kind of pizza, this is how I explain what VLANs are. So instead of a pizza, imagine a switch with four segments. Each segment has a different type of data. Because this, this pizza, let me explain, is a little bit of food uh, information. It's making me hungry now. <laughs> so in a Four Seasons pizza, each quarter has a different ingredient. So for spring, you have artichokes. That's vegetable. In summer, you have olives. Again, vegetable. In autumn, you have mushrooms. And in winter, you have ham. Uh, sorry for vegetarians. I guess there aren't many of them in Italy. Anyway, each part has a different uh, filling. Imagine that as a switch, a network switch with four parts. Each part has different data. So you've got one part for audio. You've got one part for amplifier monitoring. You've got one part for lighting devices. And you've got another part for internet access. Four parts, one switch. Four parts, one tasty pizza. And in a well-made pizza, you're never going to find a mushroom in spring. So you know they are well separated. So let's give a VLAN example here. VLAN 1 is colored green, and that's carrying your Dante audio. VLAN 2 is colored orange, and that's for monitoring and controlling your devices. So I've got a computer here controlling the amplifiers. I've got an iPad here controlling the mixing desk. So I've got a control network, and I've got an audio network sharing the switch. So note here, the cables are completely separate. So if a control cable gets cut, it doesn't matter. The audio is still working. Now, you could use VLANs for redundancy. You could have VLAN 1 for Dante primary, VLAN 2 for Dante secondary. This means you can make a lower cost, redundant network. You've got safety for all the cables. But yeah, of course, if a switch loses power, you're going to lose everything. But that's l unlikely. The cable cutting is, is a more common problem, and this will protect you. So it saves you the cost of switches, but it doesn't give you redundancy for the switches. And this switch, the Yamaha one, will tell you which VLAN is used by which network port. Now let me tell you about trunks. Yeah, trunk as in, do you call it elephant trunk? No, it's, it's no, like that, elephant trunk. <laughs> it's the same word here. 
trunks. So, we've got two cables for our two VLANs. Why can't we make it one cable to save cable cost and to save setup? Well, we can. That's what a trunk is. A trunk will combine two or more VLANs into one cable. So now here, we have a one cable solution carrying both primary and secondary networks. So it's going to combine the networks together, carry them, and then split them apart again in this switch. So a trunk is always from one switch to another switch. But you must never exceed the one gigabit bandwidth here unless you know you are using a fiber port which has 10 gigabit infrastructure. Some fibers can carry 10 gigabits per second. So what happens if you break this cable? Everything is lost if that cable gets cut. That's a risk. But you don't have to have that risk. With a trunk, we can create something called link aggregation. That then allows us to use two cables for one trunk and we have our redundancy back again. If one cable gets cut, all of the data goes down the other cable. So we've got redundancy again for our trunk using link aggregation. So the Yamaha switches can do that for you. Let's conclude. I hope you've all learned a lot. Let's just recap with a conclusion. Remember, use Cat5e or better. Better means Cat6 or Cat7. If you use fiber, you've got no interference. So fiber can be very useful for long distance connections. Use the cable tools and testers. Get to know how to make your Cat5 cables. One termination should take you less than 60 seconds once you've had some practice. Dante is the best audio network for live events because of its low latency, redundancy, Dante controller software, and number of devices available. When you make a network, always check the IP addresses are in the same subnet, they're compatible, and check your Dante clock master. Then, final points, think before planning. Do I need redundancy? If you don't, you can save time and cost. How many VLANs do I need in my network? Do I need a different one for lighting uh, devices? or for control. How much bandwidth do you need? Remember, four channels is 10 megabits per second. <laughs>